Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Season 3 of the Audiobook Club with John York, a podcast celebrating every aspect of audiobook production and the surrounding industry. The Audiobook Club is sponsored by Amplify Audiobooks by Pro Audio Voices. To hear more about the phenomenal movements Amplify Audiobooks is making for independent authors in the audiobook space, you can find a direct link in the bio of this episode, as well as a short but informative advertisement within this interview. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined by audiobook narrator and actor Ellie Gossage. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. How are you today? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. Um, delighted to be here. Very excited to see where this goes. Yeah, well, I'm so thrilled uh, to have you on. I've been wanting you on the show for ages uh, since we connected at APAC. So uh, thank you so much for doing and taking the time for doing this. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's it's fun. Good way to spend the day. I'm excited to just <laughs> connect. I don't know. It's cool. Well, I'm going to start by asking you a huge question, if that's okay. Um, essentially, I'd love to start by asking you about your background. Um, so could you tell us about how you you know, first fell in love with theatre, acting, and how that later expanded into audiobooks? Absolutely. I will try to not let this be the 20-minute ramble that it could be. <laughs> um, I was a very uh, gregarious child. Um, I was always the one that was like, okay, we're going to dress up and do a play. So I don't think that there was ever really a time that it was in question that I would be an actor. Um, I did all the school plays. I did all the community plays. I just did theater endlessly. I loved theater. Um, and I still love theater. I love musical theater. I loved all of it. And so I auditioned for all the schools in the country um, to go to school for music theater. And then I got into NYU for just straight theater mm. and ended up deciding that was the best fit for me. So I went to NYU for theater. I had a really positive experience there. I think that it's really a varied experience for people at NYU. So I don't tend to like overly recommend it. Mm -hmm. But I think... Being in New York is really valuable as an actor. Um, and it certainly was for me. I love living in New York. Um, and that was really big. And I've always been a big Shakespeare person, big classical actor. Um, I followed sort of the classical theater path in my uh, NYU education. And when I graduated, I did a lot of regional and educational um, theater, predominantly Shakespeare. Mm. Um, but it was actually... Um, a New York sort of off off Broadway festival um, show where I had a friend who was like, have you heard of ACX? I do all these audiobooks and it pays my rent. And I was like, what? No, I love audiobooks. I've always loved audiobooks. Um, and this was, you know, I was 19. I was so young, 19 or 20. I just graduated college. Um, and that sounded super fun. And it had never really occurred to me that audiobook narration was something that people did. And I don't think at that time it occurred to me either the audiobook narration was something that people really did seriously because ACX didn't feel serious. It felt like go on there and like bang out an audition and maybe you'll get to do somebody's book for $25, right? Yeah. Which in retrospect, I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just none of it. I, I had no sense of the industry at that point in time. Um, so I did a decent amount of uh, sort of underpaid ACX work on books that you know, in retrospect, we're pretty good books, right? They're fun, independently published, lots of sort of um, YA fantasy kind of vibes, which I really loved. Um, and then it finally, finally in like 20, 20 or so dawned on me that you could have a real audiobook career. You didn't just have to do indie books forever. You totally could. I, there's nothing wrong with doing indie books forever. But th the way I was doing them it wasn't really a career. It was a hobby in addition to the acting. Um, and so I sat down and I did some serious coaching for a while and uh, joined the APA and went to my first conference um, in 2022. Yes, 2022, the virtual APAC, and started to work with some bigger publishers and have sort of built from there. So I still do indie books, periodic ACX books, that sort of thing. But I do mostly publisher work now, which is a big step <laughs> up as far as I'm concerned. And it makes up the entirety of my income. I don't day job. I don't any of that. And that's just been really wonderful. It's wonderful to feel like I have a job in a career versus what if I wake up and I'm a nanny at 45, which there's nothing wrong with, but really wasn't, didn't feel like a career to me. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that, that was sort of general. <laughs> 
No, that's amazing. So when you were first when you first started doing them on ACX, well, in terms of like your enjoyment of it, were you enjoying them so much? Um, like at that stage, was it like when you sat down and was like, okay, I'm going to take this seriously now. I'm going to really, you know, take coaching and go into all of that. Was that like, was did you sort of find yourself like super enjoying the process and just wanting to move on to better projects, or like how, or was that like a slow, gradual realization that you enjoyed it? Like, how did that kind <laughs> I mean, of work it, about? It's a really good question. Um, I I've always just loved I, reading aloud. Um, Like I said, I nannied for years and a huge part of nannying is reading out loud. And my mother read out loud to me growing up. My mother, my father, everyone read out loud growing up. I listened to audiobooks. I've just always really enjoyed it. So the reading out loud was really exciting. And I think that there's also a little bit of overlap in the like classical theater. Mm -hmm. Voice work is a really big part of that. And so that sort of listening to yourself perform feels like it's sort of derivative of classical theater in certain ways for me. Um, And I think that really what it was, it was less that, I mean, obviously I wanted to be doing better books, but I think it was also that it occurred to me that maybe I could be making a living doing it, which I think was a huge motivator for being like, okay, let's stop doing, you know, theater gigs, non-union theater gigs and doing an ACX book just like, by the seat of my pants and be like, what would this look like if I was actually good at it? And what would that take? And how would that reflect? And so I talked to a bunch of theater people I knew and tried to pull together some contacts of people I could just meet with and talk to them about an audiobook career before I really got into coaching, which was kind of cool. Yeah. That sounds great. When you first started out, and this could that could be like while you were doing ACX or maybe even the first few books after that coaching session, um, after mm-hmm. taking coaching, like were there any sort of challenges that you came across that were perhaps kind of unseen before Gosh. you began um, your first titles? I feel like it's just always challenges. I Do you know what I mean? I don't feel like yeah. I've hit the point where it feels like smooth sailing all the time. There, there's the obvious challenges that are just getting the right people's attention, right? That's a constant challenge. I have sort of gone through phases of, I'll feel like I'm doing a really good job. And then it will occur to me that like, maybe I haven't been doing a really good job and I'll go back and listen to things and be like, wait, I'm doing this wrong. And then I have to go away and coach and fix it. That's always a little disheartening because you're like, oh, I've done four books with this like vocal tick I wish I didn't have. But that's it's good that you hear it and you can fix it. I feel like I've had a couple of phases of that since I started really working on this a little more seriously of being like, oh, I really don't like that I do that when I'm narrating. And so that's been a little bit of a challenge. I personally have really struggled with what do you put under a pseudonym and what do you put under your name? And Mm. I don't think I've navigated it well. And when I sit down and look at it, I'm like, part of what you said initially was, what is the point of a pseudonym? Like, just don't do work that you wouldn't put on your name. I don't Mm. agree with that anymore. Like, Mm -hmm. do, do any work and put stuff under a pseudonym. But also don't just put things under a pseudonym because you're like, ooh, maybe this is like, I don't like the idea of a pseudonym being something that you do for like, well, I wouldn't put this on network TV. At least for me, that doesn't resonate necessarily. I actually really love the idea of having pseudonyms for different genres, Mm -hmm. just because I think that it makes you a little easier to navigate for listeners. Mm -hmm. But I've done none of that. So I feel like my, the, the pseudonym has been a big challenge for me and the way that I interact with my pseudonym and what I put under it, I'm constantly negotiating for myself. No, I, I resonate with that. Um, I, I resonate with that all too well. Um, I sort of struggled with the, so I started to, um, John York is my pseudonym, but it's just sort of become <laughs> who I am now. <laughs> who as a you are as... Be- yeah, because it was the only <laughs> name that I was getting cast under anything. Uh-huh. And so it's like, <laughs> so when you meet people at networking events and you want them, you know, in case they sort of audible mm-hmm. search you, um, right. you know, you want some titles to show up and stuff. So then I just became this and then I don't know whether I should go back to the other, like That's very my funny. real name. So it's really... Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 so um, you mentioned um, at the start, talking about your background, um, about your experience performing um, uh, in Shakespeare, a lot of Shakespeare's plays. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Shakespeare, of course, is uh, you know, it's notorious for the language and mm-hmm. how even the most um, simple inflections can change the performance you know, so much. Do mm-hmm. you think working on projects such as those plays with, with you know, such a detail for language and vocal performance specifically has helped you in the narration space? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it would be impossible for it not to. 
I don't necessarily think it's given me a leg up on other actors with mm -hmm. similar experience or even other actors that just have film experience or just have musical theater experience. Um, I'm not sure that it's, at least for me, been a massive improvement on that kind of experience, but I do think it's a huge leg up people that don't have a theatrical background. Um, I think theater in general really does make you contemplate language. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because I have a lot of actor friends that I think are phenomenal actors, but aren't spectacular cold readers. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that audiobooks are in a lot of ways about as close to a cold read as you can get, right? You're going to read it first. It's not a cold read, but it's sort of like a lukewarm read. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah, not yeah. memorized. You're not putting it up memorized. You're not even putting it up like having practiced it a couple of times um, most of the time. And so I think that the classical theater has really helped with that, that being able to like pull text off the page mm -hmm. and embody it quickly, I think is something that I've really pulled from theater that mm. has been really useful. Mm. I think that's, re that's really fascinating. Actually. I think it's interesting because I think when we record things for, you know, record our demos or record like maybe samples that we're going to, we have an mm -hmm. idea to be used in a, a demo. We go over it a few times, you know, mm -hmm. we sort of tweak it. We, we, we put so much effort into that, but then you are right. It's most, it is a lukewarm read at best when you actually yeah. get into a proper book. So it's a, it's a completely different skill, um, which I think is a really interesting uh topic of conversation actually um are you narrating mostly from your home studio at this moment i do i narrate almost mm. entirely from my home studio I, which i quite like um i've had a couple of opportunities to go into the studio that i've said no to mm. that i've been like no i'm happy to do it from home and recently i've sort of been having a turn on that of trying to accept studio opportunities and i found that studio has a lot of benefits and at home has a lot of benefits um mm -hmm. and i don't know necessarily that i prefer one over the other um but I, almost entirely at home i would say most of the project i'm sent aren't an option there you have a home studio we're grateful for that please record this at home yeah so like what does your recording process look when you're recording from home like how do you structure your your recording day? What a great question. Um, I think that lots of audiobook narrators have a really sort of intelligent, very put together process for this. Um, and I don't. Um, I The biggest benefit of this job for me is that a friend can call me the night before and be like, I'm moving tomorrow, can you help? And I can drop what I was doing to do that. I love that ability. I love the ability of being like, oh, well, I'd really like to go to a yoga class at 10 a.m. tomorrow, so I'll work from 5 to 10 p.m. tomorrow instead of from 9 to 4. I'm not a routine person. Mm -hmm. um, and that gets me in trouble periodically, but I also think that it adds a great deal of joy to my life. I drink a lot of tea. I also find that like in the studio, you just record for six hours, right? You'll take a lunch break, but you'll just record for six hours straight. It's very efficient. I yeah. don't do that at home. I'll, I'll do a chapter and then I'll wander off and do a load of laundry. Or I'll do four chapters in a row because I'm feeling very focused and motivated. There'd be a lot of narrators that are like, you're not doing yourself any favors for that. And I'm sure that there's some, um, that, they're, that they absolutely have a point in some ways. But I find that it's really nice to be able to say, well, today I'm going to record 12 hours, right? Like I've got I've got the passion, I've got the deadline, I've got the whatever that says today is a work all day kind of day. And the other days I'm like, oh, it's been two hours and I don't feel like it anymore. <laughs> That's great. I'm setting my own schedule. I'm not holding anybody back as long as my projects get submitted on time and get submitted well. I think yeah. that really it doesn't matter how I'm scheduling when I record. Mm -hmm. And I really love that. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing, I think it's like the, the like the biggest benefit for this kind of work <laughs> totally is that like is. you know there's not many sort of there's not many sort of acting gigs where you get to perform when you want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So I think yeah, taking full advantage sure. of that, yeah. Something I really love about it is that I don't like waking up in the mornings. Okay. And there's such a stigma around like, well, get up and be efficient with your mornings or be productive with your mornings. Um, and I just, I would prefer to wake up at 9 a.m. That is that is a nice early morning for me. And that's really nice that this accommodates that for me, that I don't mm -hmm. feel like I'm recording tired or I don't feel like I'm, uh, do you know what I mean? Putting myself mm -hmm. in positions where I, oftentimes in a rehearsal process, I'll just show up and I, I've gotten so little sleep because I don't function early as well. 
And so you're doing these 10 hour rehearsal days and then you're going home and having to be like, okay, you have to go to bed. You have to go to bed. And I'm just not very good at it. And so I love that that level of like scheduled 7 a.m. take the train for two hours kind of days is not part of this. And so that when it is part of my life, it's like, great, I haven't done this in a while and that's easy. And it's not just the entirety of my living. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you often find, I think, I mean, I've fallen into this trap before of like seeing myself like more of as a business owner slash freelancer kind of person. Mm -hmm. So I need to be up at 5am doing yoga and then straight (laughs) into the booth doing all this stuff. And then that kind of made me really miserable. And then I was talking to a friend about it and they were like, well, why are you not thinking of yourself more as an an artist? And then you can sort of allow yourself that bit of leeway. to interesting distinction. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it won't be the same for everybody, you know. Right. I think the more, the more, um, I think I think it's more beneficial to kind of work out like kind of what works for you individually and sort of as you as you said there mm-hmm. is sort of if someone like it doesn't matter if someone says that you're supposed to get up at 6 a.m. and do all this stuff if that doesn't work for you and you perform better at, you know at later in the day mm-hmm. then it's the smarter decision to say actually I'm going to run my own schedule and it's also more fun mm-hmm. yeah and it just it's nice I do my roommate's also a audiobook narrator so we do share the booth mm-hmm. um she narrates mostly in studio, which is really nice for me. Yeah. But periodically we have to negotiate, oh, can I pop in and do a, an audition really quickly? Or, oh, I've got this at this time. What does your schedule look like? And mm-hmm. I really like that that's possible. It's possible for us to share this workspace. It wouldn't be if we both narrated at home as frequently as I do. But she has a lot of other things that she does as well. And that's great. It's really a lovely like co-working kind of vibe that we have as well as again it's just flexibility i really Mm -hmm. enjoy the flexibility Mm -hmm. so one of the um one of the issues can or one of the challenges i should say mostly from working from home is that obviously if you're working from home and then you're living at home and especially if you have a roommate that's also (laughs) doing audiobooks and stuff that your life could very quickly become audiobooks and nothing else like Mm -hmm. how would like do you find yourself sort of you know how how do you find your experience with the kind of like work life balance kind of thing from like working from home predominantly are you good at uh, achieving that balance so uh, work life balance is like maybe I'll take that phrase and put it over here because I'm not sure I'm great at work life balance but answering your question of not just being at home all the time mm-hmm. um something that i love about audiobooks is not having coworkers because when I do a play, right, that you rehearse from nine to five and you spend all of that time with all of these people that are your friends and your peers and also people that maybe you want to network with and like you have to make a good impression on and the show's better if you're all friends. And it's yeah. so much social energy. Um, and even, you know, when you're working a day job, you're doing all of that as well, right? You're exerting all that social energy. Um, and I really love with the audiobooks that I get to be at home have that this like alone time this like Mm -hmm. rebuild my energy time that's my job right so it's sort of like doing double duty and then when i'm done i just get to hang out with people i like the rest of the time you know and it's not to say you don't like your coworkers, but they're people you have to hang out with and if you like them that's awesome and if you don't you still have to make that work um whereas i get to go and just hang out with my friends for my social time and so my alone time can be my work time and my social time can be like the people i want to be connecting with and i love that about the job work-life balance doesn't feel like it's a recording from home problem for me it feels like it's a well but i could probably squeeze that project in well i don't want to say no to new work well i'd love the extra money here well that sounds fun it doesn't pay very well but it's it sounds really cool um and so i'll get myself in trouble of like just saying yes to everything which i think is sort of a earlier freelancer problem i think that people become more secure that they're gonna have the work Mm -hmm. um more secure that they can say no and it won't ruin a relationship And I can see that starting to build, but it is something I really struggle with. And so I think my work life gets off and just that, like, I enjoy my work so much that often I'll do it for fun. I really struggled with that with the acting, too. It's like I have free time and I could do, like, a fun thing, like read a book or do an activity. Or if I have time to read a book, well, I could be prepping a book instead. Yeah. Or I could be submitting auditions instead. Like, I have time. Why am I not using that on? I really struggle with that work-life balance. Mm but not really the 
I spend all my time at home one. I'm really good at getting out of the house. I'm always fascinated by how pre-production and prep work differently for each narrator. Um, Could you take us through maybe what, you know, prep typically looks like for you? (laughs) It's a great question. I will say I do think prep really varies from book to book. Uh, Or at least I find that more in an ideal world where I'm doing everything right. um, I still like to read the book and highlight all the lines in different colors as I go through, which does double duty of it does make it easier to narrate, especially um, I, for instance, I'm narrating a book right now that I didn't highlight when I prepped and none of the none of the lines have quotations. They're all just in paragraphs because of the way that the prose is written. I should have highlighted it because I'm constantly having to stop and be like, wait, that's somebody speaking versus that's the narration. Yeah. Um, this is one that I really wish I'd taken the time to highlight beforehand, but it's fine. It's just lengthened my recording time on mm-hmm. the book. Um, so something I really like about the highlights is I, I know immediately who's speaking. It, I don't I don't screw that up. Mm-hmm. Um, it does take more time. It also forces me to read the book. Right. So not just skim the book. I have to actually read the book if I'm highlighting, Um, which it can be really easy to skim a book, especially since this isn't a book you chose to read. Right. It's not a book that you went to the library and read the plot summary and were like, I really want to read this. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of whether or not it's a really good book, there's just books that you'll do that you're not personally as gripped by as hopefully other listeners will be. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those are the ones that it really helps to highlight for me because it keeps me engaged. It keeps me actively not drifting off while I prep. Um, Or even if I'm just tired and I'm not, I would not usually be reading right now because it's, (laughs) I'm distracted, right? The the highlight helps me. Um, I'll read all the way through it. Highlighting all the lines too lets me know all the characters in the book. Immediately I know the characters. It's easy. I don't have to like make sure that I meticulously note them down because I can just go back through and look at the colors and be like, okay, that's that character and that's that character and that's that character. I think in an ideal world, I think it really depends on the genre. Um, In a romance novel, sometimes I won't make a character list, right? Romance genres often have a stock set of characters. You'll have the the main character, the best friend, the main you know, yeah. male main character, all of that. I don't necessarily know that I need to mark that unless there's something weird. I'll mark accents. I'll mark anything that I feel like stood out about a character. But mm-hmm. if they're just sort of, quote unquote, run of the mill best friend, then I've gotten the vibe of that best friend. What makes them non run of the mill from just like reading through the book? Um, if I'm doing fantasy or something like that, I'll make a character list. It's just important because you have to manage accents. You have to manage pronunciations. You have to manage like where people are from and how they connect to each other. It's a lot harder in fantasy and sci-fi, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, But if I'm doing nonfiction, there'll be a lot more words that I don't know. So I will underline words I don't know um, that I have to look up pronunciations on. Recording from home, if it's nonfiction, maybe I'll make a list beforehand or maybe I'll just underline them and I'll look up the pronunciation when I get to it. I will usually make a list that I'll send back to a publisher if I'm working with a publisher of pronunciation questions, whether they're names or character voices or that Mm -hmm. sort of thing send that back. I don't usually have those with romance novels. I don't usually have those with fiction novels. Those are usually fantasy, sci-fi, nonfiction. For me, at -hmm. least. I just find that there's less questions people need to answer. And then I always do a search and find for the word accent because it really sucks to miss that word. That's a really good tip for people, you know. (laughs) (laughs) You get to the end. Hopefully I caught it the first time, but if I didn't, I search and found (laughs) it. You do hear stories from people who, like, you know, which is totally so believable and so, like, it can happen to mm-hmm. anybody. If your eyes just glaze over for a second and then you miss, like, right. he says in his German accent and you're like, what? Right, and it's never mentioned again. <laughs> you're like, when did that happen? Yeah. Um, or it was in a paragraph of, like, narration that you sort yeah. of skimmed through, right? That That's the sort of place that it can get lost for me. I will say I prep, like, second and third books in a series a little more loosely than I'll prep a first book in a series. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll go through and see, are there new characters? But I'm not as precious about, I have to know what the, I have to get a feel for this book. I already have a feel for the world in the series. Mm-hmm. And so a prep of a second or third book can usually be quicker for me mm-hmm. than a first book prep in a series. If you're, if you're like working, if you start working on a series with an author, with a publisher, with this, you know, the same author, mm-hmm. um, are there any sort of questions that you will ask them about the characters? Because like one for me, I, yes. yeah, there's one for me that I got burnt out on. It wasn't my fault, I'll explain. Um, that I did, it was like the throwaway character in book one. 
it barely made the character list. It was like right at the mm-hmm. bottom. So I did this like throwaway voice for it. It was fine. And, you know, just a couple of lines and stuff. And I did like mm-hmm. a weird accent and like, you know, uh, sort of a husky, husky tone for it. And then the author was like about... I want to say about eight months later was like, oh yeah, I've written this book, but I've made that they, that character is the main like right. guy in this. And, and like, now you have no! a dumb, unsustainable <laughs> accent for this character. Yeah. Um, I will say I've had that happen on an ACX series before. I will, if it's like one or two lines from that character, I'll sometimes just change the voice. I'll ask, hey, yeah. do you mind if I just change the voice? I think the voice I picked in that book didn't work and it was just two lines. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes... I will slowly morph the voice into something a little more sustainable, right? So if he had a thick German accent that was a little like, you know, I'm in a German accent, right? right? Very cartoony German accent. Yeah. I'll so- try to like be like, well, maybe it's a more natural toned down version of that. So that listeners are like, well, yeah, he still has the German accent, but yeah. I don't think of him as like a cartoon Nazi. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So yeah. like, I think that I think that there is some leeway. I will say that I try to, if I'm asking questions about a series, are any of these characters secret villains? Because Mm -hmm. that happens all the time. Like, please let me know who are the villains of this series and who will become the villain of the series. Um, Who's related to whom? I like to know. Uh, I've asked that before because sometimes that's not clear in the first book. Um, and will any of these characters become main characters later? I do ask that question sometimes with a series. Yeah, it's hard. It's like interesting to think through. I think the villain question is really important yeah. because you don't want to be like, that's one that you'll have a character book one that they're trying, they're blending in, right? Yeah. And so you'll give them like a, I'm such a good guy voice. And later, like, are you going to do the villain speech? And you're like, I'm such a good guy voice. Like, I <laughs> hope not. <laughs> so you want to have some like, that's one that will just kill you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good uh, that's a very good tip for for those listening and indeed myself um, are there any sort of character types or personality traits in characters that you enjoy performing uh, you know either in the narration space or you know on stage or in you know other acting mediums are there any that spring to mind you know it's fascinating because i'm sure it's different in audiobooks than it is for me on stage because i tend to really enjoy sort of uh, wacky or unusual characters on stage which i never get to play because i <laughs> look so traditionally one thing um, I'd really have to work to to break out of the type I have, and I enjoy playing my type, so that's fine. But with audiobooks, type is a completely different question. I tend to, I do enjoy villains. I mm-hmm. tend to enjoy bitchy characters, whether they're male or female. Like anyone who gets to kind of sneer while they talk, I think is really fun. I do love accents in books. Uh, I go back and forth on like, I feel like I'm a person that does accents well, but then sometimes I'll be doing a book and I'll be like, I'm shit. I'm absolute shit at this. Like, why am I even doing this? Um, so it's something that I think that I could could stand to build some confidence in because I think confidence is really important. But I've got a couple accents that I do really well. And so I always enjoy when a character has an accent I feel like I'm really good at. Love accents on stage. Accents on stage, totally different conversation because <laughs> you get to memorize your lines in the accent. So I don't know. I, I enjoy that. Sometimes I enjoy the character who comes up And you're like, ah, you are the seventh female character in this scene. I have not thought about you. Okay. And you just like give him a voice. And then you're like, I really like this voice. I I hope this character has more (laughs) time. I love that. Like the surprise character that you didn't really think about. They're not a very big character. And suddenly you're like, oh, I've made all these choices I'm really excited about. (laughs) I love that character because I think they come up more often than you think. You're like, oh, this will be a throwaway voice. But you already used a couple of throwaway voices. Yeah. Um, and it's probably not a good way to think about it, throwaway voice. But, you know, you've got like woman number two. I do hate it when woman number two turns out to be a character who has a name that I didn't clock in my prep. I'll miss that in prep sometimes of like yeah. said the soldier. And pretty soon that soldier is actually a character with a name. But I missed the point they transitioned. Yeah. Um, and so those are ones I always have to laboriously go back and fix. And that's <laughs> that's always a little annoying, but yeah. it happens. Yeah. Well, I resonate. I, I re- really resonate with you on that, um, especially with the bitchy characters and stuff. It's like, mm-hmm. I find it so therapeutic to just get in the booth and just be <laughs> awful. You know, just like if you spend, like I, re- I narrate in the mornings. So it's like, I can just, I just spend my morning being horrendously sneery <laughs> and just awful. And then I come out and have a great afternoon. Right. And, I've got it and it's never a system. way you can be in life, right? Mm. Or that you would want to be in life. But it's really fun yeah. to get to do that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like, but it sort of works in the opposite way. I, I, if I, if I'm doing like a YA and it's like a really innocent 
main character oh, no. and it's you know everything's so amazing and you can tell that you know the character's intentions is just good just wants the world to be great and everything's mm-hmm. wonderful i come out raging <laughs> i'm just like mm-hmm. i just need to go shout and be awful so yeah. like, i need to yes <laughs> <laughs> no it's fun to have some relief i will say one of my least favorite parts about audiobook narrating is when you're in a book and you're like oh i think i hate this character <laughs> And then every time they do something dumb, you have to be like, that was dumb. And open the door and be like, Jordan, they did something dumb. Do you know what I mean? Like that just like you're so invested in the choices they're making that you're like, why are they being such an idiot right now? That kills me. bro. And I'm like, I just have to live with I have to live with the choices this character is going to make for the rest of the book. And when you're reading it on the page, it's not that big of a deal. But suddenly you've been like living it and you're like, actually, every single one of these problems is one you created. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I always yeah. think that's kind of funny. With my uh, my sister is a sound engineer and she uh, edits all of my stuff, so we'll be oh, working fun. working on some stuff. And, and um, I won't say this has been a recent thing, but the uh, this, there was a story <laughs> where it just like it just took a turn and like it just didn't. Mm-hmm. There was there was things wrong with it. And uh, I just get texts every so often from my sister who was editing like the days before, just going like, what the fuck is going on with this thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, this thing? And it was like, that makes it that makes it a little bit hel- uh, healthier for me. So I'm just not mm-hmm. raging inside. Oh, uh, I love it too. Yeah. Like I'll do, I do a bunch of duet narration um, yeah. where I'll just do the female lines. And that's so fun because I can be recording them and then write off to the male narrator. Can you believe they did this X, Y, Z? Right. And that's so fun. Whereas yeah. like dual doesn't quite do that because your chapters are yours and their chapters are theirs. And mm-hmm. so they're not as immersed in it. But the duet, we're both reading the same nonsense. <laughs> and that's really fun. I always yeah. love that sort of camaraderie that yeah. you get from having a co-narrator. Yeah. Def- I definitely think it's like it's it's nice, especially if you've because um, I I quite miss working with people truthfully, um, just you know just just in general. And so it's like when I do I get the opportunity to at least like, even if it's just like mm-hmm. an email thread where you're like yeah. I'm thinking about <laughs> doing this for this guy is that all right? You know, um, I, I I always find it just quite nice to mm-hmm. quite nice to join. I think it small team makes you know? your coworkers more precious too mm. than if you had to see them all the time. I, yeah, because I always enjoy the moments when you get to like really connect with somebody. Mm-hmm. And then there's people I've worked with for years that I just, you know, they could be a, a blob alien for all I know. I have <laughs> absolutely no concept of what they're like as a person. And that's always sort of trippy. I think it is a sense of disappointment, especially in like the romance space. If you're doing like, you know, you've got your own POV chapters and you're working with other narrators. And, um, you know, if you're working with narrators who have like a big fan base and mm. they will always say oh, what was it like like working with this narrator and you have to go oh, amazing amazing I didn't actually speak to them mm. I never said two words to them right. but I'm sure it would have been amazing <laughs> yeah I'm sure they're a great person who I have no sense of at all um it's part of what makes a multicast really fun I anytime I'm on a multicast it's great because someone will say something some ridiculous line right and everyone will snicker and that's really fun yeah um, to just have those moments that feel very theatrical, right? That's a very rehearsal room vibe. And you miss that collaborative element. That is something I really miss is the mm. the sense of collaboration mm. in art. It's a very solo art and it often doesn't feel like you have a whole lot of artistic control in a lot of ways. And so I and find myself craving that a little bit. A large part of um, the audience for this podcast uh, are narrators who uh, early on in their narration careers you know uh, so for those starting out or in those early stages have you got any advice that you could offer them (laughs) from your own narration journey I I mean I think I've had a very non like like Penguin Random House didn't just email me one day and say please come be the next great narrator which sometimes it really feels like your favorite narrators all ended up narrating that way regardless of whether it's true um but I, my big recommendation is, especially if you're pursuing independent work, just put it all under a pseudonym. Like you can be John York, who all of all of your work is great and um, that's awesome. Then you can work under that pseudonym forevermore. Or you can be like, here's my work. I'm very proud of it. I would like to start working under my real name. But if you're not one of those two things, you can be like. Joe Schmo? That's not me. I never heard of them. Like, I have no association with that person who made four terrible books. Um, yeah. That sounds awful. But, like, 
obviously be as prepared as you can and as and as good as you can when you start. Like it's somebody's book and take good care of it. But also be gentle with the fact that you're new and your first book may or may not be your best book. And it's really nice to have the option of saying, okay, that book happened and I did my best. And also it doesn't serve me for that to be on my resume. Mm. That's something I really wish that I had done, that I could, especially since I was absolutely just screwing around, it feels like, in retrospect, <laughs> with audiobooks initially. And I don't recommend you do that. I recommend that you, like, go coach and meet real people and, like, get into the industry on the right foot. Mm -hmm. um, and if you didn't, right, like, if you screwed around and were like, oh, maybe I should take this seriously like I did, that's fine, too. Like, you'll figure it out. You can always be good at any point as long as you're not mean. So being bad isn't terrible. Being mean is terrible. And so yeah. I think that that's a big distinction. Like be on time. Be the things that you know that are good. Like easy to work with, on time, punctual. And then if you're terrible, that's fixable. And you probably won't be. So that's my big recommendation is like put some stuff under a pseudonym and then see if you like it. Yeah, I think that's great. I think don't be a dick is very is actually like the well, don't be is a so dick, underrated like don't do that in anything you're not getting yeah. anywhere by being a dick i think it's, it's, it's surprising you know of how how many sort of opportunities can come around just from getting along with people and mm -hmm. like just from like you know because i think we all like to work with people who we you know we, we enjoy we enjoy being mm -hmm. in their company yeah, 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 or just like sure. want nice things for them to happen mm -hmm. and stuff so it's like i think yeah i think i do actually think all jokes aside i think that's actually one of the major <laughs> major things for people to remember because right. you never you know because one it's nice to be nice but then also it's like opportunities can come from just like being friends with somebody right being friendly be generous with your information this is a personal you don't have to be this way lots of people don't agree with this i feel very strongly in the like don't pull the ladder up behind you mm -hmm. kind of philosophy of if somebody asks you for help and you're in a position to give it right it's not taxing on you it's not difficult you're not being put out by it give mm -hmm. that because that just it's career karma it will come back any opportunity you have to be generous with your time and your resources is an opportunity that hopefully somebody will take to be generous with theirs to you. Um, and so obviously do not expect things for free from people that have a lot of knowledge, right? Pay for the things that you know you should be paying for. But also, generally speaking, there is nothing that you know and could keep from somebody that will make your career better. Mm. And I really feel that about acting too. Like if I have an audition that I'm up for that I think my friend would be good for too, it does not hurt me to send it to my friend. Because if I'm better, I'll get the role. And if they're better, they should get the role. And so I just think it's really important to be generous with your opportunities. And people will remember you as the person who is generous with your opportunities and be generous with theirs in the future. And I think that's always really good advice. I think that's a really great point. Um, definitely. I think, I don't know about, have you found like uh, narrators specifically being quite generous with that? Because I, I think I have more than other I totally like, areas. Have. I had a woman I met at APAC last year. I talked to her for 20 minutes. She said, please email me. Um, much later in her career, very successful narrator. I did email her. I asked her a whole bunch of questions. She answered them. I was like, yeah, I'm really excited. My big goal is working with Macmillan. She hooked me up with Macmillan last year, and I mm. just did my first book for them Amazing. from that connection. Unbelievable. Unbelievably generous thing she did. And I have to believe at some point in time, I will have an opportunity to, if not pay that back to her, pay it back to another narrator down the line yeah. but she didn't have to do any of that and it was a huge career thing for me yeah. um it was a publisher i really wanted to work with and it was specifically her email i think that got me there and that's so cool that's so cool to see like just that and that's back to don't be a dick right be somebody someone wants to give opportunities to <laughs> yeah no absolutely though but that's that's amazing um congratulations yeah, really cool. on that thank you <laughs> that, that was really awesome <laughs> So um, this is the only question that could be considered uh, left field. Uh, so do feel free to skip it if you think it's crap or you want to. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, sure it'll be fine. It's nothing. <laughs> uh, what's what's a question that you wished you asked more? Oh, interesting. I do wish that publishers would ask me more what genres I'd like to narrate. But that's a little different. I don't know. I mean, that's I don't I don't really. I feel like I go around feeling like I'm not being asked the right questions. You mm -hmm. asked a lot of good questions. Um, 
getting to say my piece on the be generous with your narration is big for me. I like that one. So when I tell people I'm a narrator, I often wish that they would not ask, oh, great. Have you done anything I might have heard? Because like, I don't know, I could be doing New York Times bestsellers and I still would not know the answer to that question. Yeah. I'd have a better answer to that question. But like, unless I'm doing New York Times bestsellers, what do you yeah. expect me to say here? Um, I do wish people would rephrase that question to um, what are you really excited about that you've narrated? Mm. Um, or even to do you have some genres that you typically narrate in? And this isn't really a like question I need you, John York, to <laughs> ask me. Um, but it is a question that I wish that like the pedestrian that I run into who just wants to small talk about my career for a minute would ask is not. What have you done that I might have heard? I have no idea. Yeah. And quite frankly, I do predominantly lesbian romance novels. Are you a lesbian? Do you like romance novels? You probably haven't heard anything I've done. Yeah. Okay. You know, like, I don't know. Do you listen to indie author audiobooks? I do a bunch of those too. It just feels like there's potentially a more incisive question there. I would say don't ask a question that can be answered with a yes or a no. You know, because yeah. that one I can just be like, no. That's yeah. the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's not what I do. I understand it's a gambit for conversation, but yeah. I wish people would ask me more what I like the most about my job. Probably, yeah. yeah you are right, though, about the um, about have you done anything that I would have li like listened to? There's also like if if they if they uh, so I did um, after I did the I did a book for Disney uh, a few mm, months ago. That's so fun. And after <laughs> it was it was really, like the coolest thing I've ever done. I ever just across life, but the um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but the. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I throw it into conversation just as often as I can get. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, but people go, like, "Oh, can you do the voice of like Captain Hook, or can you do the voice of Hades and stuff?" And it's like it's like kind of well intentioned, but you're like, mm -hmm. I kind of really don't want to, if I'm honest. Yeah, I wish I could be the kind of person that was like, "Yeah, totally, I'll do the voice for you." Yeah. <laughs> but the little gremlin of my soul crawls up and goes, "No." <laughs> I don't do any accents and I don't do any voices. And in fact, I have never spoken a word in my life and you will not hear me speak any. Like, I just yeah. don't want to. It's a, it quite, it, like you said, I don't want to. And I wish it did, but it don't. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes from, for myself, it just comes from like a crippling anxiety that I do it right. and it'll just sound crap. And, and like, it'll be bad. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh. Ooh, <laughs> like, uh -huh. you know, like, yikes, bro. No, yeah. for sure. It's whenever someone asks you to do an accent, you're like, I can do it, but it's going to be bad out of context right now for you. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely certain it will be bad. Yeah. So it's, it's just a lose lose. And then mm -hmm. it's anyway, my next question <laughs> that I was going to ask you just so happened to genuinely be about genres. Um, yeah, and about, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are there any genres that you haven't had a chance to explore that you would like to down the line? I think and maybe the answer is not yes for everyone. I have to assume it's yes for everyone. Um, and if it's not, congratulations. Um, but so, like I said, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I passionately listen to fantasy, YA fantasy, mm. adult fantasy, 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 all the way down. I just love it. And, um, and I want to work for Macmillan because they publish all the audiobooks I love, right? Um, and so I wish I would love to do more fantasy. And I say that, and I will get set fantasy that I'm like, well, I didn't mean that. And so I think that that's not really fair, right? Because I do some fantasy. It's, it's terrible to say, but I would love to do fantasy that I would like to read. I think everyone who likes to read really wants to do books that they love to read. I would love to do a like murder mystery thriller. I think that that would be really fun. I think the acting would be really fun there. And I never get to do those. <laughs> Almost ever. <laughs> Um, the thing that's fun about being an audiobook narrator, though, is that I do feel like I have gotten to do one of a lot of these genres. Like, you know, I have one nonfiction. I have one mystery. I have one, like, two or three children's books, right? So yeah. I, it's fun that you do get opportunities to do a variety of things. Um, really, for me, I would just love to be doing books that I feel a bit of a stronger connection to, which I mm -hmm. think is just sort of like another level up for me, where I'm not saying yes to absolutely everything, where mm -hmm. I feel like I have a little bit more control over what I'm doing. And I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. Um, I think I have a little more coaching and work to do before I quite get to the level that I'm like, yeah, I love the things I'm narrating. Mm -hmm. But it's not like a genre so much as it's a, I'm really excited about 
the next project that I read it and I'm like, oh, this book's I, I call my mom and I'm like, you have to read this book, right? That's the book I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I haven't quite had that experience yet. I've had a couple, I've had a bunch of books and I'm like, I think this is a good book, but it's not a book that I would like. Like if someone was like, oh, I really want an XYZ type of book. I'm not sure it would be the first book that popped to my head just from my own personal taste point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not true. If you need a lesbian romance novel recommendation, I have many. And that's just because I do a ton of that. And so I think that when you only do one or two of something, yeah, it's really hard for it to be like top five of that genre for you. But I'm excited to have that first book that I've got someone in my life that I'm like, I just narrated a book you'll love. I will say sometimes I get to do like a heavy, serious book. And I'll do it and I'll be like, oh, I'm so happy for the change and get done and be like, so happy my next five books are romance novels. Yeah. Like, I love romance personally being a big part of my genre career because I'm guaranteed, not guaranteed, but like mostly guaranteed a happy book with a happy ending with some people that are just like living their happy lives. Right. I'm not going to have to deal with like child neglect or like um the de- depression or like something that's like heavy that I have to live with for a while so I enjoy oh, yeah. that they're sort of very they don't they don't sit on my chest kind of books I love that about romance they're just fun I'd love to uh, end the show by simply asking if there's anything that you're working on right now that is bringing you excitement enjoyment that you're looking forward to coming out anything at all well like I said I just finished the book with Macmillan a very mm. very sweet rom com queer romance novel um it's just, I grew up reading romance novels, hetero romance novels, and this would have been one of my favorites if I had had that queer romance growing up. I, I really loved it. So it's called Late Bloomer. It's very cute. It also, this is so silly, but it has all these author notes at the end that we read that are just like a stand up comedy routine. They're really fun. And they're just about how she decided to name the book. She had all these other ideas for what to name the book. And I do think that she picked a really good one, but she had some really funny ones that are a hoot. So I don't know. I really enjoyed that. I'm very excited it's coming out. Oh, I did this great book with. Uh, another queer romance I I do a lot of queer romance but this one was like on a movie set and it was very much like alien was directed by a woman and Sigourney Weaver had a a hot lesbian romance with the director of alien like that kind of vibe Um, it was very Laura Dern in Jurassic Park they were filming a Jurassic Park type movie and so it was really fun that like 1990s film vibe the um and the, I really loved that there was so much of it that was the way these two women riffed off each other artistically. Like mm-hmm. they really had a, a romance of the artistic mind before they had any kind of actual romance. And that was just so exciting and fulfilling for me because you crave that, that like really intuitive collaboration with somebody. So I loved that one. Um, that one just came out like two days ago that sounds amazing well what i'll do is uh, for those listening who want to check it out uh, or check those uh, books out i will make sure that they're linked in the show uh, show notes so folks can go check that out uh, but that sounds amazing um well that brings us to a close for this episode of the audiobook club all of the links to ellie's social media platforms and website uh, will be linked in the social notes in the show notes i should say uh thank you so much for tuning in and of course A huge, huge thank you to you, Ellie, for joining us. Thank you so much. This was such a treat. Thank you. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at proaudiovoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.